Thanks for praying that uh, as we open God's word today. It wasn't planned, but that's an appropriate prayer on reconciliation in a message that uh, is ultimately about reconciliation, but it's also a message that makes you realize how far it takes to get to a place of reconciliation, which is, uh, which is both true in our own lives, it's true in our communities, and it's true in our nation and in our world. So uh, we are reading today from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 36. If you've got your Bibles uh, or your devices, you can turn to it. It will be on the screen. David, I might get you to do this first part. And if you're watching online, I encourage you as well uh, to, uh, to open your Bibles as we look at uh, what I just really cannot do justice. Uh, uh, this section of teaching really probably needs a lot more time. Um, so I'm just going to focus on Luke 6 verses 27 to 36. And I'm going to read it and read it slowly. But before I read it, let me pray. Lord, this is um, a profound teaching that you give to your disciples about the way of discipleship and the way of your kingdom. It's one, Lord, that some, for some of us might be incredibly difficult. And for some of us, Lord, may feel incredibly um, unattainable. Uh, Father, for whatever reasons we, we bring uh, our, um, our pain, our uh, trauma to you in this passage, I pray that we might hear your spirit, that we might hear uh, your love and your grace for us, and that it might guide us into continuing to pursue um, love and forgiveness and ultimately reconciliation um, alongside justice. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 6, 27 to 36. But you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Oh. If there was ever something that Jesus said in the Bible, that leaves me feeling how far I have to grow and leaves me feeling like this is too hard, this is too impractical, it's this. It's this teaching. Uh, Jesus is teaching an ethic for living in his kingdom here that seems so outrageous. It seems so beyond what we can uh, live up to. Um, and yet it shaped the early church. This teaching here has shaped the world. Just these few verses. Um, and it, it, it distinguished the church from the philosophy of the Greeks and the legalism of the Jews. And it's equals, equally meant to distinguish us today uh, from our world around us. Um, because it, in, it invites us to live in relationships and in communities and in society in a way that is just radically different. <coughs> radically different. Um, these words informed Gandhi's non-aggressive resistance that led to the liberation of India from British rule. These words shaped Martin Luther King's life and work in the civil rights movement. Uh, these words 
sparked a decade-long prayer movement in, in East Germany's Protestant churches that contributed ultimately to the collapse of the Soviet Union. These words framed Nelson Mandela and the Truth and Reconciliation Movement in South Africa that led to the dismantling of apartheid. These words are dynamite. And they're all modelled on this small passage that we've read. These people changed the world because these words changed their lives. And it changed the way that they lived and led. Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Love, do good, bless, pray. Love, do good, bless, pray. For those who don't deserve it. Now, I want us to just assume that Jesus is not delusional here. That this is not some utopian kind of pipe dream and that he's actually proposing something here as he looks at his disciples who are listening to him and he is proposing something that is possible uh, in the present, albeit imperfectly, um, for his disciples and for us. But ultimately, it is fulfilled one day when Jesus returned. Imperfect now, perfect one day. The kingdom has come and is yet to come. When Jesus teaches us to pray, your kingdom come, he's thinking these kinds of words, this kind of teaching. Um, uh, he's, 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 he's believing for a transformation to take place. Uh, then this is part of what it will look like. The word enemy here, love your enemies, is language we don't... Uh, we don't use often enemy, I don't think, on the whole. We, we save it for extreme situations like um, you know, when one nation invades another nation. We would call those people the enemies. Uh, but just in case we want to keep enemies to some kind of category that, um, that doesn't really relate to us because we're not being invaded by the Romans uh, or any other nation, Jesus says, no, but do good to people who hate you. Bless people who curse you. In other words, speak about you in a slanderous or untrue ways. And pray even for those who by their actions mistreat you. Jesus is thinking in terms of everyday relationships here when he uses the word enemy. Uh, and in categories that are clear when he says from verse 29, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn, them the, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold it and so on your shirt not just the Romans but anyone anyone who has mistreated you or taken advantage of you or misrepresented you uh, your response is love do good bless pray anyone he, he says um, because if you just do it with those that are going to do it back to you then there's not much credit in that but these, these ethics of the kingdom are not just for those that we like or like us. Um, so it's a love that is, is not a reciprocal love. What's interesting about this love, it's in the first time in the Gospels that this word, the strongest word for love is used. This is the word agape love. This is God's love. We are to use God's love as we love and do good and bless and pray. This is the first time that we find those words. And this kind of love that this is talking about here is non-reciprocal love. It's an uncompensated love. It's a, it's a love that is fully and freely given by the, by the, the, the uh, bestower to the beloved for their blessing and flourishing. It's like no other love. It's that love. Can you think of an example of that love? I think parenting can feel like that love sometimes. Non-reciprocal, uncompensated. I think it can feel like that sometimes. Uh, I think that kind of love looks like some people in our church today uh, caring for a child or a parent or a spouse who is incapacitated in some way. I won't mention your names, but there are people in this room 
who my heart lights up for because I see the love that you show for the people in your life that can offer very little back to you. I I see it also, uh, I see this love for people serving in life care, working to help people for whom those people will never reciprocate. It's that kind of love that Jesus is talking about here. Non-compensated, non-reciprocal. And interestingly, you know, he says in verse 31, what sounds like the golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you. Actually, that golden rule is, was in, um, both in Hellenistic and Hebraic culture was actually said in the reverse. The rule in, in the other religions and, um, and in Hellenistic uh, philosophical culture was do not do to others what you would not do them, have them do to you. But Jesus flips it. And he says, do to others as you would have them do to you. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that one is passive and one is active. Jesus, this is different. This is not just neutrality of love. This is not just reciprocity. But it's doing good to them regardless of their reciprocity. It's doing good even if they're someone you don't like. It's doing good to others as you would have them do. That means you're on the front foot. It's not you're just not doing anything that anyone wouldn't do to you. You're actually doing good to others in the way that you would want them to do it to you. It's radical. I wonder, how do you feel about this teaching? How do you feel about what Jesus is asking of those who are, he says, who are listening to him and who are his disciples? How do you feel about it? Honestly, being really, really honest, sometimes I find it hard to like the people that love me, let alone love the people that dislike me. I don't think I have too many enemies. I know I've definitely disappointed people over the years. I know I've, I've gotten people offside. I know I've lost friendships over the years. I've seen people leave church over the years. And I know that most of that probably is really trivial compared to many in the room who have deep family conflicts, who have fled violent, coercive partners, who've needed to take out AVOs, who have not spoken to neighbours for years, that there are people you refuse to have anything to do with anymore, people that hurt you, and you, you moved state or you moved church or you moved address or you deleted them from your social media. And you may not hate the person because that's not a very Christianly thing to say, uh, but you certainly don't love them or do good to them or bless them or pray for them. Um, and I count myself in that as well too. Because um, no one really knows how much they hurt you, and I, I get that. No one knows um, that. And, and, and so one of the ways that we do it is we just turn our love off, don't we? We, we, uh, we just stop treating the person like a human being. And I want to acknowledge in this room that that there are a lot of people that carry a lot of hurt. And this cornerstone of Jesus' ethic and his teaching here, frankly, sounds really hard to apply when you have been taken advantage of, maybe you've been ripped off, maybe uh, you've been excluded, or you've been slandered, or you've been mistreated, or you're the one that's been misrepresented. When you bring it down to reality... And what you've actually experienced in life, this feels really, really nice, but impossible. So nothing I'm about to say, nothing what Jesus is saying here dismisses or makes any of what you've experienced okay. Jesus is not condoning any of that. His teaching is not forgetting or ignoring the wrong. Um, So let me be really clear on this. Jesus is not saying ignore justice. And just be kind to people who are mean and manipulative and abusive. That is not what Jesus' teaching is here. uh, That is not the outcome of the passage. Turning the cheek and offering the other is not saying they slap you, let them slap the other cheek as well too. I don't know how we got there, but that's often how we interpret it. It's not saying take their abuse and ask for more. 
It simply can't mean that because Jesus never sacrifices justice, never overlooks sin, never condones dehumanizing of people. Jesus has come to bring justice. Remember back in Luke 4, Jesus' opening sermon that we read was about how Jesus had come to marginalize people, to proclaim good news for the poor, freedom from prisoners, recovery of sight for the sight from blind, and to set oppressed people free. It was a message of justice. The Lord's Prayer that we read just a few weeks ago, deliver us from evil. And to the Pharisees in Luke eleven forty three, Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God, uh, you give um, Pharisees because uh, you, you apply the law around tithing all the way down to garden herbs. You, you, you tithe your mint and your cumin, he goes on to say, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Justice matters to God. And it, Scripture has to interpret Scripture. This passage has to be about upholding justice. This passage is not saying go soft on justice. But Jesus says your obligation is to more than justice. Your obligation is also to love. Justice and love. Your obligation is to both of them. Um, how, how do we usually respond to hurt or offense or, or pain? I, with probably three basic responses that we have. I'm going to call them the passive pacifists. And, and, um, but that's just some people are just have really a humble, forgiving attitude. They overlook it. Maybe they minimize it or they don't confront it because they don't like conflict, um, even though they're already in it. But, but essentially, uh, the, the passive pacifist is someone sometimes that can just beautifully just let go of everything. It's like they have a Teflon coating. But often, you know, for some people, actually a whole, a whole theology of, of um, nonviolence was built around this passage as well too. So some people theologically would, would say that there is a strong case for nonviolence uh, in Christian ethics. And then maybe there's the, the justice warriors, uh, sort of at the other end. The justice warriors are kind of passionate about justice. They have a high justice meter and they're not afraid to confront that person or that group. They don't like to see people get let off the hook. Don't go soft on justice ever. Um, they're the activists. They're the ones that want to make sure that we deal with all of the areas of injustice that we see in our world. They're the ones that will march in the protests. They're the ones that will, um, will want us to get in touch with what's wrong good it's really good too so that's that's the justice war and then there's, there's like the internally outraged i reckon a lot of us can be internally outraged the internally outraged we, we present like we have our feelings under control and like we, we, we've let it go and we've moved on and we've forgiven but things aren't quite as they seem are they on the outside, our hands are open, but on the inside, our fists are clenched. On the inside, we're bitterly angry. And we want revenge, and we want that person to suffer. And we, we externally look loving, but internally, we're angry and resentful, and we've turned off our love, and we've cancelled them in our hearts, and sometimes uh, to others as well, too. We see them only for their offense. We see them only for what they've done wrong to us. We see them for their history and for their sin. We might be diplomatic and friendly because they might still be in church. But on the inside, we're treating them like enemies. Which, which category do you relate to? There's a couple of extremes there. And there's what often happens in the middle You see what Jesus is saying here is that none of these options will do. That's what Jesus is saying. No, nah, they're all bad options. If that's all that they are. You see, I was thinking about this. See, it works like this. Justice without love 
equals resolution without relationship. But love without justice equals relationship without resolution. And neither ultimately lead to reconciliation, which is what we were praying about before. That's why it's so hard to get there. Because you can't just pick justice and you can't just pick love. Because one will lead to maybe fixing it, resolving it, but there's no relationship. One might lead to relationship, but it's actually still there. So it's not even, it's not even fully relationship. It can't be either justice or love. It has to be both in Jesus' kingdom. Which is, Jesus is just reaffirming what's already been said. If you go back to Mike 6.8, what is, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? Do justly, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. There it is, holding it together. Act justly, love mercy. We have to hold them together as we walk forward. Uh, when Jesus says, turn and offer them the other cheek, like I said before, he's not saying, uh, don't worry about injustice. Let them disrespect you some more. Listen, he, why, do we go, why do we go there with that? Why do we think that? Actually, no, I think he is saying, keep showing them your face, not your back. Because it's the same as not withholding yourself or your resources in the next couplets of verses. Keep showing them your face, don't show them your back. When we are still facing them, we are not walking away, we're not slapping them back. We're not sacrificing justice as we stand and face them. Nor are we sacrificing generosity and relationship. One commentator says it this way, we, often, we, uh, we offer the other cheek so that in time, maybe it will be met with a kiss rather than a slap. Jesus is pointing us all here, friends, to another way in all of our relationships, and it's the way of love and justice. Actively calling out the wrong, seeking justice and truth on the outside and on the inside, love and forgiveness. That, that, that's the combination. Justice and love, inside and outside. It's saying, I am here. Here is what I've experienced. Here is the problem as I see it. This needs to be changed. And whether that's a personal issue or a national issue like, like in, uh, reconciliation, this needs to be changed. Transformation must happen and I'm right here. I'm not turning away. I'm in the relationship. I'm with you. I have not turned my back on you. It has to be different to the way it was. And it won't ever be the way it was again. But I'm willing to walk forward with you. In whatever that looks like. That is truth and justice. That is love and mercy and forgiveness together. What, is, what does this produce? What does love and justice together produce? It produces forgiveness. It produces healing. And sometimes, like I said, sometimes reconciliation. But they're different things, aren't they? Forgiveness and reconciliation. Because it takes two to be reconciled. Um, and this is not exactly, exactly what Jesus does of bringing love and justice and carrying them together. Think about Jesus. Think about the cross. While Jesus was uh, in that last week of his passion, while the religious leaders were cursing him, while the crowds mocked him, while the centurions put their fist in his face and their whip on his back, while they stole his shirt and cast lots for it, while the disciples deserted him and betrayed him with a kiss on the cheek. He was loving. He was doing good. He was blessing. And he was praying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. See, on the cross, don't, don't you see? Justice and sacrificial love kiss. They join. Jesus' outstretched arms 
pinned to that cross is both a sign of justice, a horrible sign of it, but it's also the sign of an embrace. For as Jesus says, God is kind to the ungrateful and wicked, and he is merciful to those who don't deserve it. Which, by the way, is you and me. When you think enemy, do you think of yourself? Enemy of God? Probably we don't. But you were. But because of a cross, because justice and love meet, God adopts you. God adopts enemies and makes them children. God adopts enemies. Enemies and makes them children and calls us friend. It's the nature of God to love his enemies. And therefore it is the nature of God's people to do likewise. Because that is, that is the cross. That is the gospel. That is the gospel that fuels Jesus' words here and helps us to also do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. So how, how do you... Where do we go from here? How, how, do you, how do you love and do good and bless and pray? How do you do justice? How do you love mercy in a world full of so much pain and so much heartache? I don't really have all the answers. I don't have half the answers. But what scripture tells me is, as Jesus says, we should do justice, love mercy as we walk humbly with our God. Walk humbly with him. Remember this is how God treated you. You were an enemy. As we read in Romans 5.10, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We, we must start from a place of our own state if we're going to look at the relationships uh, that we have with others and the big issues of society that need a Christian response. We've got to look at the state of our own heart and walk humbly with God in that. Um, how much have we been reconciled? How much were we enemies of God? How much has he adopted you and I? Oh, it's heavy. <laughs> Secondly, I think uh, walk humbly, think empathically. Uh, on this journey, there is something important that we can each do, which involves listening and involves considering w why the pain is there, what, why, the, why the person perhaps caused the pain. Uh, I think having a generous assumption that people are all carrying pain and people who are in pain often cause pain um, that everybody has a backstory. Everybody. Everybody's got something that's gone on in their life. Uh, they're living in unseen consequences for other people's actions. It's generational, isn't it? Generational sin. There's a cycle. There is, there's a cycle of violence that is perpetuated from one generation. Everybody's got a backstory, and I think it's just really good for us to, before we... Before we uh, you know, look at this, the next part of the passage, look at the speck in someone's eye, we think about the planks in our own, and then we realize that the, that the speck in their eye is also the, the product of a whole bunch of planks in other people's eyes. So think empathically. Um, and thirdly, as we've been thinking, pray generously. And Jesus said, you know, pray, um, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Pray generously. P praying is sometimes the, the, the place to begin for the person that's wronged you. Pray for them. Pray that they would know that Jesus loves them. Pray that they would be set free. Pray that they would be healed. Pray that there is another way. Pray that your heart might also be changed, that your planks might be revealed. I think we, when we pray, we're praying, we're praying for them and we're praying for us. And I think that that has the opportunity to kind of melt our heart a little bit 
and align our heart to God's and, and ultimately forgive. Forgive ultimately. And um, Nick preached on this a few weeks ago, but it, it pops up here again. Ultimately, Jesus is clear um, that we are to seek forgiveness and offer forgiveness to others. Um, that we don't perpetuate the conflict or the violence even in our heart. It may not be happening in the, like in, in the noticeable world, but it's happening in the internal world of our life. So praying for the peace of God, for forgiveness in our heart. Jesus understood, I think, the cycle of violence when he said, you know, put down the sword, Peter, those who live by the sword, die by the sword. You want to live in that cycle? Great. Well, that's, that's the consequences, what you experience. But if I give in to this hostility, if I give in to this desire to retaliate, then I'm only feeding the very core problems that Jesus came to heal. The antidote to that ultimately is forgiveness. I don't have time, but the, um, you remember the story of the Abdallah family uh, who lost their four, uh, three children and one niece uh, in that terrible accident uh, that took place uh, when they were mowed down by a, a speeding driver. And their story, you can go and you can watch it on YouTube, but their story, the interviews that took place over the last two or three years, they've recently, I think last year, went to the Vatican and shared their story of forgiveness as well too. Their story of forgiveness is so profound. And there is one particular clip uh, where um, he's being interviewed and you can see that the newsreader is undone by his choosing to forgive because of how it would release him and his family from the burden of unforgiveness. And there is something about choosing to love and forgive over choosing bitterness that leaves the world stunned. And you can see it on this reporter's face. It leaves the world humbled, but it also leaves you freer to live without the burden. Forgive, ultimately. I just watched uh, the end of this great series on Paramount. It's called 1883. I don't know if you've got that subscription. I only got it for Star Trek and I'll ditch it soon. But uh, 1883, it's set in 1883. It's a real kind of a Wild West sort of a 10-part series about um, settlers moving, you know, taking that long, deadly journey westward from Texas to Oregon, the east to the west of the United States. Magnificently shot. Uh, but it's actually a story about, in the midst of all this beauty, this natural beauty, people living with deep, deep sadness and grief in the face of all kinds of tragedy and evil along the trail. Uh, it's a tearjerker. Uh, and the, the, cent the central character is this beautiful young woman uh, named uh, Eliza, or Elsa, sorry. Um, she's 18. She's full of life. She's like a wild teenager. And then uh, she falls in love with this, this cowboy. Um, and and um, she goes from being full of life to being filled with grief and rage when her fiancé is shot by a bandit in front of her, for her face. Uh, and um, this bandit is apprehended. And in her rage, she shoots him dead. And now she is filled after that. It's like everything goes grey in her life. And she is filled with the guilt of killing the man and the grief of losing her man. Her world goes dark. Her adolescent joy and wonder is all but snuffed out. And there's this wonderful scene where her father, who's an ex-captain in the army from the Civil War, uh, who himself has lived with immense grief and guilt. He tells uh, her his story of killing so many people in the war. And then he says this line. He, he says, Darling, the meanest thing you can do to yourself is hate someone else. The meanest thing you can do to yourself is hate someone else. And I think there is great truth in that. Or the kindest thing you can do for yourself is to stop letting your anger and your pain dominate your heart now and into the future. 
The only way to really overcome is to forgive. And when you don't forgive, you have lost to injustice. If you are bitter, if you, then you are still under the control of the person who wronged you. You are the one in prison. Until you forgive, the injustice has beaten you. You forgiving does not mean that justice is set aside. That consequences are not necessary. It does mean that the relationship um, can be put on a new footing. It doesn't mean the relationship can be reconciled, however. But I think as we walk humbly, as we think compassionately, as we pray generously and ultimately forgive, then I think the truth of Jesus' teaching becomes crystal clear. Then you are not anchored to the wounds or the injustice of your past anymore. And it means you can start to find a new story to live in where you can once more love, do good, bless, and pray. And Jesus says, then your reward will be great. You'll be called children of the Most High. You will be, you'll be, you will be a, a beautiful mirroring of who the Father is. I, I'm aware, this is a heavy, heavy, heavy sermon, that there is, there's always grief in the room. There's always a story in the room. There's always pain in the room. And I think the encouragement of Jesus from Scripture is easily one of, this is one that you could say, that's nice, but you don't understand. I encourage all of us to say, this is life. This is the way, the truth, and the life. May you walk in it.